It's possible that God has given to you a gift of healing, and you may not even know it. Now, of course, the Bible does teach that believers in general will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. So I'll be covering that a little bit, talking about the difference between the function of healing and the focus of healing, between the gift of healing and the operation of healing in the life of everyday believers. There is a gift of healing. There is an area of focused grace that God has given to certain individuals. And I want to show you from the scripture different signs that indicate to you whether or not you have the gift of healing. Look, if you even clicked on this video, if you're watching this right now, something drew you to this broadcast. Something drew you to this live stream. Something within you was caused to be filled with passion and fire and you reached out because there was a magnetism, there was a drawing. You had this urge, so to speak. You were pulled toward this content. I believe that was the Holy Spirit. And as I show you these signs that indicate to you that you may have a gift of healing, I want you to approach these prayerfully because this will be a journey through the scripture that reveals something about you. Hmm. Not only are you going to get to know more about the healing ministry, you're going to get to know more about yourself. You're going to begin to understand certain things about yourself that maybe you didn't understand before. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would do it by his word. Now, the gift of healing is different than the operation of healing. Now, that may sound like a distinction with no difference, but it's actually important that we understand this very important difference. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read to you verses 7 through 11, and we're going to see the gift of healing listed with other spiritual gifts. Watch this. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So there we see the purpose of the spiritual gifts. It's others centered. To one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. That's the word of wisdom. To another, the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same spirit gives another great faith. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages or tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So here we see the gift of healing, as I said, being listed among other spiritual gifts. So the Bible does make it clear that there is a distinct operation of healing that the Holy Spirit gives to certain individuals and not to others. Now, let's look at Mark chapter 16, because there seems to be another side of the coin here. It also seems indicated by scripture that all believers can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And this is true. Look at Mark chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Believe what? Believe the gospel. So these signs will follow believers, Christians, you. These signs will follow you. They will cast out demons in my name. And they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So those who believe, Christians, those who are born again by believing the gospel message, will have these signs following them. You don't have to chase signs. Signs will follow you if you walk according to the word of God. They will cast out demons in my name. That's deliverance. That's, that's exorcism. That's casting demons out of unbelievers. They will speak in new languages. We saw this, of course, in Acts chapter 2. Now watch this verse 18. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. Now here, the scripture is talking about exercising authority over demonic power. This is not talking about the literal handling of snakes, which uh, we sometimes see. And I'll prove that mm. to you. Look at Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 19 and 20. 
This is Jesus speaking now, and he says, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. So here, Jesus is talking about the power of what? The enemy. And then he goes on to describe this enemy as scorpions and snakes. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. So Mark chapter 16, when it talks about handling snakes or serpents, it's talking about exercising authority over the forces of darkness. And then we see they will be able to uh, drink deadly things, poisonous things without being hurt. Now we know the scripture also says to not test the Lord your God. So this is not talking about the foolish pursuit of danger and drinking things that are poisonous intentionally. But this is talking about a divine protection that comes over believers. You have a divine protection over you. And then the scripture says they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So this is a function that should be operating in the life of every believer. So what then is the point of the gift of healing? This is what I asked myself when I read these two. What then is the point of the gift of healing if every believer can lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Well, consider a couple things. Notice that back in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that the Bible listed several other spiritual gifts. For example, the Bible listed the gift of miracles. Does this mean that only those with the gift of miracles will see the miraculous in their lives? No. The Bible listed the gift of prophecy. Does this mean that only those with the gift of prophecy can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? By no means. Think about the fact that the scripture talks about discernment. Well, all believers need discernment, but there's also a gift, an operation of discernment. There's the great gift of faith. Now, wait a minute. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So every believer has a measure of faith, though not every believer has the gift of faith. Hmm. And I'll talk a little more on the gift of faith uh, later on in the message. So we see here that 1 Corinthians 12 has a context of the local church body. So then every gift that's listed in 1 Corinthians 12 is, according to verse 7, others-centered. This means these gifts are meant to be a focus of ministry grace. Now, the function is different than the focus. Every believer can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but not every believer will be focused on a prophetic ministry. Every believer can ask God for the miraculous, but not every believer will be focused on miracle ministry. You see, because 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about public expression within a church setting, this is talking about ministry influence, leadership roles, ministry itself to the body of Christ at large. What's the difference? Well, take, for example, someone like Catherine Coleman, to whom God gave a great healing ministry. She would preach the gospel and focus on praying for the sick. That was a public expression of ministry that God had given to her, which was different than the average believer being able to lay hands on the sick. Now, I say the average believer, not to say that one is lesser than, but I do want to draw this distinction and make this point very clear. Not every believer has the gift of healing. What's the difference? As I said, one is a function and one is a focus. It is more likely that someone will be healed if they're prayed for by a Christian with the gift of healing than if they're prayed for by a Christian who's simply operating in faith. Why? Because God has so graced them in that area. Take, for example, also evangelists. Aren't we all to do the work of an evangelist? Aren't we all to share our faith? Aren't we all to boldly evangelize? Of course we are. So then what then is the need of the evangelist? Well, the evangelist has an office of ministry that comes with authority and influence that doesn't come with the regular operation of evangelism. So these are ministries that God is giving. These gifts come with ministries, areas of focus and grace. So every believer has the ability to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, but there is a more potent healing grace on the one with the gift of healing. Now, I know we may not like that, and these are realities that some people might be offended at, 
But then why does God need to give us the gift of healing if everyone's just as effective in the area of healing? Mm. Why does God need to give us teachers if every believer is just as effective in the area of teaching? Why does God need to give us evangelists if every believer is just as effective in the area of evangelism? The gift of healing comes with a more potent, a more intense effectiveness in the area of miracle healing. So then this is why we need the gifts of healing operating in the church. And I believe that because you were drawn to this, that this gift may be on your life. I'm serious. In fact, I'm going to show you sign number one. And sign number one right now is going to open your eyes. It may even surprise you. Because most people don't realize that sign number one is, is one of the main indicators that they operate in this gift. And that could be you. But I want to just clarify this a little bit more, the difference between the function and the focus. You see, God has given to some this special area of grace to focus on a public ministry that comes with authority and influence. And I can show you example after example of ministries throughout church history, great healing ministries that we all know, and even ministries that we may not know. I know of many great healing ministries that weren't all that popular in worldly terminology, but still very effective for the kingdom of God. So there's the area of focus, which is also an emphasis of calling. Think about Oral Roberts. Think about Catherine Coleman. Think about A.A. A. Allen. These greats that God raised to healing ministry had focused their ministries, their callings in the area of healing. Yes, they preached the gospel. Yes, they taught the word. But ultimately, that was the primary function of their ministries. And again, it comes with a certain authority and influence that other ministries would not have. So take, for example, the office of the pastor. Now, all of us should love and care for one another and counsel and be ready to share the word and be ready to pray with people. We all should be doing pastoral work, so to speak. But not all of us are called to be pastors and step into that church leadership role or that public area of hyper focus on any one gifting. It comes with public leadership, authority and influence, a certain area of focus grace. So yes, there is a greater grace for healing miracles on the one who has the gift of healing. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the gift of healing. If every believer was just as effective in ministering healing to the sick, then we wouldn't need the gift of healing. If every believer was just as effective in evangelism, we wouldn't need the gift of the evangelist. The same goes for teachers and pastors and the gift of miracles. The very fact that the Bible tells us there are certain people gifted in these areas that others are not very clearly spells out for us that this comes with a more potent power, so to speak, in that area. Now, this has to do with aligning with God's will. This has to do with God purposing it just so. Remember, the sovereignty of God should touch every area of our doctrines, every area of our beliefs. And so God just so chooses to work through some individuals more often in the area of healing than with others. So, it's possible that you have this gift of healing. And again, especially if you were drawn to clicking on this, especially if you're watching this right now, it's very likely that you're drawn to that for a certain reason. Number one, the first sign that you can look at that will indicate to you that you have the gift of healing. Number one, you have a desire for the gift of healing and are drawn to the healing ministry. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Mm. So here we see that the scripture is telling us that there should be a desire for the spiritual gifts within our hearts. There should be a desire within you to flow in the area that God created you for. Your purpose is often linked with your passion. And if God placed a passion for healing ministry in you, or even an interest, an intrigue, and that's for a purpose. I remember when I was first called by the Lord, I was drawn to the great healing ministries. I would watch hours and hours and hours of the great healing evangelists on YouTube. Somehow we were able to get the footage from back in the day and put it on YouTube. I'm so glad for that. I would read books on the lives of the great healing evangelists. 
And I was drawn, there was like a magnetism that pulled me. I remember watching some of them, some of the more modern ones on television, and there was just this magnetism that pulled me in, and I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that I was called to the healing ministry. Maybe that's you. And it's good to desire that gift. I think sometimes we take on somewhat of a false humility. Well, I don't want it only if the Lord wants to give it to me. But I'm thinking, he already gave you the desire. I mean, really, who do you think put that desire in there? Do you think your flesh desires to have the gift of healing? Sure, the flesh might enjoy being celebrated. The flesh might enjoy the more prideful aspects that could come about as a result of what we would call successful ministry. Maybe the flesh wants the praise. Maybe the flesh wants the accolades. Maybe the flesh wants to feel special. But the desire for the gift itself, not the results of the gift that sometimes come along with it, the desire for the gift itself, that desire couldn't have come from your flesh, nor would the enemy give you a desire to do something for God. So if that desire is in you, who do you think it was that put it there? Why, it was the Holy Spirit. He gave you a desire for a gift because he gave you a destiny with that gift. That desire is an indication of your destiny. The Holy Spirit will plant desires in you, desires that are linked with your destiny. Mm. And so here you see that there's this desire in your heart, this drawing, it's almost like a fire that's stirred in you every time you hear about these great healing ministries. Or maybe you watch Encounter TV and you see the miracles, you see the powerful services that take place around the world. And when you see the power of God move like that, everything in you just says, Lord, use my life. And there's just a fire lit under you that could be the drawing of the Holy Spirit because that desire for the gift is an indication of the destiny in that gift. Now, I was talking a little bit about false humility because I think that we imagine that God gets angry with us for desiring these things. Again, remember, we already exposed that lie that it's just the enemy who gave you that desire or just your flesh. Sure, the flesh wants the, the, the accolades and the praise, but that, that, that can be with any ministry or anything that you do for God. The flesh will always want praise. The flesh will always want to take credit and glory. But aside from the credit and glory, the desire for the gift itself, that function to operate in the healing virtue of Christ, that is from the Spirit. The enemy would not give that to you, nor would your flesh desire the gift itself. And so we have this false humility sometimes. It just says, well, if he wants to give it to me, he'll give it to me. And, and you know that the desire is in your heart. You know that there's something in you that's drawn to the healing ministry. But it's false humility that causes us to step away from our destiny because we think that pursuing a gift is somehow a demonstration of pride. We think that pursuing a gift is somehow immature. Now, of course, we should pursue Christ above all. But the Bible tells us to earnestly desire the gift. Now, how could you earnestly desire something without pursuing it? How mm. could you earnestly desire something without seeking it? You hear religious people say all the time, oh, don't seek the gifts. Well, why not? The Bible says to. The Bible says to desire them. And it is that desire itself that can indicate to you that you're called to the wonderful healing ministry. Don't, don't think religiously about this. I mean, if I gifted my daughter with something, my, my, my wife wants to put our daughter into dancing lessons within the next year or so. I'm all for it. So if I pay for dance lessons, maybe in, 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 she wants to do like ballet or something like that. Maybe, maybe if I pay for those dancing lessons and then she gets on the stage and dances, I'm not going to say, oh my goodness, how dare she? How dare she make use of what I gave her? How dare she enjoy what I gave her? How dare she desire and have fun with and, and, and use what I gave her? Do you think God's doing that? Do you think God would give you a gift and then be so petty as to be annoyed that you desire it? or to be so petty as to be annoyed that you use it, or to be excited about it? No, break free from that religious nonsense that tells you that you should approach it with hesitation and with fear and, and, and with, with great, you know, you know I, that's the word I'll probably use again, is hesitation. And we hesitate in the spiritual gifts because of this false humility brought about by religious thinking. Your father rejoices in the fact that you rejoice in what he has given you. Your father rejoices in the fact that you function in certain gifts. 
He's applauding you. He's cheering you on. He's not angry that you're using what he gave you. Mm. He's not angry that you're acting on the desires that he put in your spirit. Pursue the gift. Earnestly desire that gift. That magnetism was put there for a purpose. In fact, this desire might be so strong in you. I'm going to tell you something. Here's, here's a, a, a bit of insight here. This desire for the healing ministry might be so strong in you that you have dreams about people being healed. Wow. I know this because when I was about 12 or 13 years old, when I first started stepping into the healing ministry, it, it was so consuming for me. Again, I never lost focus of Jesus, but I was so excited about this gift. I was so amazed by this divine attribute, this, this, this virtue of Christ. Think about that, that you could lay hands on someone and sickness leaves their body. Wow. That so fascinated me, that so intrigued me, that I would begin to have dreams about miracles taking place. I would begin to have dreams about people coming out of wheelchairs and being healed. I would feel the power of God in my dreams. That electric surge that you sometimes feel in the services, I would begin to feel that in my dreams. And maybe your desire for that gift is so intense, so strong, that you yourself are having dreams of the sick being healed. Don't be ashamed of the godly desires that you have. Come on. Don't be ashamed of the godly desires that you have. And don't go under the guise of this false humility where you, where you reject the gift because you're trying not to be prideful. That's not pride accepting the gift. Denying your gift isn't humility. I want to, that's for somebody watching this. Denying your gift isn't humility. Now, if you denied the source of that gift, yeah, that would be pride. But denying your gift isn't humility. Humility is simply acknowledging where it came from and whose glory it's for. But to deny it outright is not humility. So I want you to make a commitment right now. I'm about to give you sign number two, and, and this one is going to go deep into the heart. But, but before I give you sign number two, I want you to make a commitment right now. In your mind, in your heart, as I begin to read these and list these to you, as we take this journey through the scripture together, I want you to determine in your heart right now, right this moment, that you will fulfill the call that God has placed on your life. Tell God to use you. Surrender to it. Don't fight that idea. Don't put that desire on the back burner. Don't ignore what God has placed into you. Don't ignore that magnetism, that drawing of the spirit. Don't ignore that. Make the commitment right now, and I want you to write it in the comment section. Whether you're watching live or the replay, I want you to make a public commitment right now. And maybe years from now, you can come back and look at the comment. Let others see it so they can hold you accountable. I want you to write it. I know you might be hesitating to do that because maybe you might be nervous. Again, maybe that false humility is coming over you. No. Thank him for the gift. Right now in the comment section, thank God for the gift of healing. Thank God that he's using your life. And I want you, however you want to word it, Tell God to use your life. Some may write, spend me for your glory. Some may write, Lord, use me. Some may write, I embrace the gift. Some may write, I embrace the call. Whatever the Spirit leads you to write, maybe it was what I said there, or something that the Holy Spirit's leading you to write, write it right now. Don't hesitate, don't hold back, and don't let religious thinking keep you from pursuing what God has for you. Sign number two. This one is, as I said, going to go deep to the heart. Sign number two, you have a deep compassion for the sick and the afflicted. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Wow. We see this tying together. The gift of healing with the compassion of heart. Maybe you're someone who is drawn to the suffering, not in an unhealthy way, not in a way that you seek to suffer to, to where you go near them and, you know, they say misery loves company. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this spiritual strength that you have, this encouraging spirit that you have, and you see the sick and everything in you just desires to do something about it. Your, your heart is broken for them. Hmm. 
Maybe you're a person who's very empathetic. Do you realize that empathy and compassion go hand in hand? And the very fact that you can relate to people's troubles, the very fact that you care about people's troubles, the very fact that you can't walk away from someone who is afflicted without thinking about them all day is a sign that you may have a gift of healing. No, really, there's been times where I've gone to pray for someone and I will think about them almost every day for the next week. And I can't get them out of my, I can't get their face out of my head. And I'll continue to pray for them. Lord, please heal them. Lord, please restore their body. Remove that sickness and disease in Jesus' name. And that compassion is a sign that God has gifted you in healing. Why? Because healing and compassion go hand in hand. If you want longevity in the healing ministry, you're going to need compassion. Because if you're not careful, if you don't have compassion, people just become crowds. You know, it's possible to care about crowds, but not people. Wow. That's a dangerous place to be in ministry. But compassion will keep you going. See, the crowds alone are not motivation enough. Crowds show up, crowds come, crowds go. Sometimes crowds are large, sometimes crowds are not so large. But that's not the point of ministry. If crowds are your motivation, if attention is your motivation, if praise is your motivation, that won't keep you long term. Of course, our love for Jesus keeps us long term. And of course, our confidence in the calling that he placed on our lives keeps us long term. But another thing that helps to ground you in longevity is compassion. Maybe you yourself suffered with the sickness. You're healed now or maybe still going through it. And you're wondering why God allowed that in your life. Not that he sent it, but you're wondering why it was allowed. Could it be that your suffering in sickness was a setup for a healing ministry? Could it be that the pain that you experienced while you were afflicted with disease was a setup for a healing ministry? Hmm. I think about a, a great evangelist who many of you have heard me talk about before. He wasn't a famous evangelist, and we got to get that out of our minds, that fame and effectiveness somehow are tied hand to hand. No, they're not. Uh, effectiveness and success is simply whether or not you obeyed God. If you obey God, that in itself is success. But there was an evangelist by the name of Steve Romine. Powerful inspiration to me. I remember I was 14 years old. I would watch Steve Romine praying for the sick. And he was quite a comedic guy. Like he would do a lot of funny things and he was just energetic. And there was just a, he just kind of beamed with this Holy Ghost energy around him. There was just light surrounding this man. And he has since passed away. In fact, we celebrate here at the ministry, November 11th is Steve Romine Day because that was the day that he went home to be with the Lord. And you know, he ministered to the sick from a wheelchair. He had MS. And for several years, his body deteriorated. He began to lose the use of his muscles. I was there in his home with him on his deathbed. And I remember him looking up, and as I'm there with him, he's just praying in tongues. I remember he looked up almost past us. He was looking up past us and just looking at something we could not see as he prayed in tongues. But what an inspiration he was. Wow. I remember seeing him from that wheelchair while on medication, witnessing miracles. Wow. And you know, he would tell me that. He would point that out. He wasn't as I said, he was comedic, but he was also very bold. He just, he went places everyone else was afraid to go. And he just, he was just kind of stating the obvious. You know, some people, when someone's sick, they kind of skirt around the issue or try to pretend like they don't see their sickness. It, it just makes it awkward, you know? He, he didn't make it awkward. He just straight up said, you know, I asked God why he uses me even though I myself need a healing. Why, God, do you use me to heal the sick? And that healing virtue flows through me, yet I myself am not healed. And he had seen great miracles. He had seen God restore. He, had, he saw people come out of wheelchairs. And he wondered why God didn't do it for him. But he just trusted the Lord. But you see, in his sickness, he found that compassion. Now again, I am not saying that God sends sickness and disease. I don't believe that for a second. The scripture doesn't teach that. Um, at least in the New Testament sense. It, th there are some nuances to that statement, of course, but that's not what we're talking about right now. But you know, I believe that maybe you went through that sickness, maybe you're going through that sickness, and you're going to come out of that situation with compassion in your heart. Maybe you have a loved one who died of a sickness. 
I know of many men in the healing ministry and women in the healing ministry who lost a loved one to disease. And that was one of the fires that was lit in them that God used to motivate them for healing ministry. Why? Because it birthed compassion. You're not just empathetic for no reason. God made you empathetic with the purpose. Your, your suffering had a point to it. There was a purpose for that. There is a purpose in it. And it is in sickness and disease that we gain compassion for those. Because, you see, I'm very aware of the fact that at our services, there are people who've flown in from international places. I'm very aware of the fact that sometimes people will fly 14 hours just to be in one service and then turn around and go home. I'm very aware of the fact that people drive 8, 10, 12 hours to be in one of our services just to receive prayer because they want God to heal them. Right. And I constantly have to remind myself, you know, I get to lay hands on the sick. And in this season of my life, and prayerfully in every season of my life, I'll continue to experience good health. But, you know, I remind myself that those people, if they don't receive their miracle, they have to go home and they're suffering still. I get to lay hands on the sick, see the miracles. But, yes, I'm also aware that sometimes I'll lay hands on someone They'll go back to their car. They have to go back to that wheelchair. They have to go back to that special bed. They have to use that special equipment just to sleep and move around and eat. And they go back to that place. I get to go uh, with, with my ministry team out to dinner after a service. And we get to fly to another state or another country. I'm very aware of that. And that, that is not lost on me, which is why uh, Mr. Moctezuma and I will stick around after each service where there's not a... I mean, sometimes we're forced to leave because they want to wrap up the venue and close things up. And we only mm -hmm. paid for a certain amount of time. But for the most part, we try to stick around and pray for people and, and speak with people. And, you know, some people, they drove for hours. At least they just want prayer. That compassion is what drives longevity in the healing ministry. So that's number two. You have a deep compassion for the sick and afflicted. And in fact, this is another bit of insight here. In fact, um, um, so, so, so sometimes in services, I will sense a physical pain on my body. In my shoulder, if someone's, or, or, or in my neck, or in my eye, or wherever. Someone will be standing in front of me. I'll start to f feel a physical pain somewhere in my body. And that's how I know that person is suffering with pain in that area. Wow. Why? Because that's spiritual empathy. Watch this now. That's spiritual empathy. It's a supernatural empathy that comes on those who operate in the healing ministry. It's compassion by the Holy Spirit. So, number one, you have a desire for the gift of healing and are drawn to the healing ministry. Number two, you have a deep compassion for the sick and afflicted. Number three, this one's quite interesting. I know the last point was really heavy. This one's really interesting. You have tangible manifestations of power around you. Now, what does that word tangible mean? It simply means touchable or physical or causing the physical realm to react, something that you can feel and sense in the natural realm, the physical realm. So it can be handled, it can be felt, it can be, be it's tangible, there's a touch to it. So there are tangible manifestations of power that happen around you. The anointing is tangible. There is a physical reality to God's power. This is one of the mysteries of the anointing that really wows me. Many of you have come to our services and people testify that while they're waiting in line to get into one of our services, sometimes people with their spiritual hunger will line up two or three hours before the service even begins. We've had some people line up in the morning and the service is at night. Right. And they line up, why? Because they're spiritually hungry mm -hmm. and people testify to sensing electric currents moving through their body while they're waiting in line wow. or heat moving through their body while they're waiting in line, physical manifestations of power. And then when the service begins, if you ever watch the people coming up to give their testimonies, which is one of my favorite parts, because I get to hear what God did. But as people come up to give their testimonies, people say that the moment they step on the platform, their legs become like jello. Now, of course, we mm -hmm. know this has nothing to do with me. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
They step on the platform and they just suddenly, not only did they have trouble walking, they have trouble focusing and talking, they're just in a whole different world. It's a spiritual reality that they step into. What is that? That is the tangible touch of God's power. And it's biblical. Look at Luke chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 44, 45, and 46. Watch this. It's a very famous scripture, but I want to point something out to you that maybe you might not have considered. Maybe you have, maybe you have not. We'll see. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. So Jesus physically felt that tangible power that was on his being flow out of him. There's a story I like to tell about the healing evangelist Smith Wigglesworth. Now, Smith Wigglesworth was doing a revival in a local town, and he was invited to stay in the home of a couple that would be attending the revival. Actually, the wife was attending the revival. The husband wasn't really serving God. So each night, Smith Wigglesworth would come, and he would preach that revival, and then he would go back to this couple's house. In fact, they gave him their bed. Well, they slept in another room. The husband wasn't too happy about this, but the wife insisted that they honor the man of God. So Smith Wigglesworth sleeps in this couple's bed while they're in the other room every single night after he's done preaching. So he would go preach, pray for the sick, minister under God's power, then come back and sleep in their bed while they were in the other room. So this woman, the whole time of the revival, was believing for God to touch her husband. God, please save him. God, please set him free. God, please deliver him. She's just praying for him, for his hard heart to be softened. And so, the day finally came where the revival meetings were over, and it was time for Smith Wigglesworth to go home. He left to the front door, walked past the yard, and began to walk down the street when the woman ran out to stop him. And she began to plead on behalf of her husband. And as the story goes, Mr. Smith Wigglesworth, without even missing a step, he's continuing to walk and just turns back to this woman and says, don't change the sheets. Hmm. Well, she listened to the man of God. And that night, and for several nights in a row, that husband began to have dreams where he was deeply convicted by the Holy Spirit and he would see visions of hell. And so, one night, he jumps out of bed, he's tired of the torment, and he cries out to be saved. Why? Because of the tangible touch of the power of the Holy Ghost. We see examples of this all throughout Scripture. There's this residue that the anointing leaves. Right. Elisha's bones. That's 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Peter's shadow. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. Paul's handkerchiefs, that's Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. The dunamis power that we read of in Luke chapter 8 is also found in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 36. Think about the anointing oil that we're to use when laying hands on the sick, that's James 5, 14. Think about how Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that was deposited in him when, when he laid hands on him, that physical touch, that's 2 Timothy 1, 6. And think about how the sorcerer tried to buy this in Acts chapter 8. So there are examples of this physical touch. The source, Simon the sorcerer who saw that the Holy Spirit came upon people. He saw it because it was tangible. So this power has a tangible touch to it. This is why, I'm going to tell you something, and, and some of you, when you hear this, your, your mind's going to be blown because you've probably had this experience. And in fact, I'd be very interested to see it in the comment section right now. I'm going to tell you this and let me know if this has happened to you. Because people come to me all the time and they ask this question. They say, David, what happens if while I'm praying, I sometimes feel heat on my hands? Now, I know that's happened to you, possibly, because there's some who's, definitely some who's happened to, because that is a common manifestation that indicates a gift of healing. Now, that alone is not the indication. Maybe it might be the temperature in some instances. Who knows? But there are instances 
where the power of God will come on you and you will feel a heat on your hands. In fact, there have been times where I knew to pray for someone for healing because my hands got really hot. Wow. So I'm just praying for them like normal. And then I start to feel this heat on my hand, both hands. And then I know it's time to minister to the sick. Why? Because that power is being activated. I'm already looking at the comments. So yes, so lots of people mm -hmm. saying that's happened. Okay, so this is one of the signs right here. The tell us too, if you're watching on the replay, I want to know. So, so, so not only is it heat, sometimes people feel like electricity, currents pulsing up and down their body. Some people feel like water flowing through the surface. Some people feel this weightiness come on them. Sometimes they feel like weight come on their hands. Sometimes people may report seeing light around you or your face glowing. I know this sounds almost like a, a point to brag about, but really it's just an indication that the Holy Spirit has activated a supernatural, tangible touch on your physical being, which is an indication that you have the gift of healing. You're enjoying wow. this and you think other people need to hear this, go ahead and leave a like on this video right now, whether you're watching live or on replay. If you think other people need to hear this and you're going right now, oh my goodness, you're talking right to me, leave a like so that you can help spread the word. Okay, number four. This is sign number four. We got four, five, and six to go, okay? Number four, the sick are drawn to you. Mark chapter 1, verse 32 says, That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. Now, notice that whenever Jesus was around, the sick were brought to him. And this wasn't just because of the stories they had heard. There was something about the presence of Jesus. There was something about his countenance, his demeanor, his physical being. To where people knew there was something special on him. People knew that there was, there was a tangible touch on his life. When the gift of healing is active in your life, not only is there that physical manifestation of tangible power sometimes, but people are drawn to you. The sick are drawn to you. Have you ever noticed that more often than not, when someone is sick, they come to you for prayer? Why do you think that is? What do you think it was about you that made them single you out? You see, their faith is stirred around you. They just come to you because they just believe for some reason, isn't that odd? That for some reason, they just believe that your prayer can do something. See, this is why I'm pointing these signs out to you because we miss these all the time. I promise you, for the most part, the people who come to you can't even tell you why they come to you. They just see something. There's something about your person. There's something about your being. There's something about who you are in Christ that they just know that if they're sick, they ought to come to you. Why? Because the sick are drawn. People's faith are stirred around you. This is why, um, okay, we're going to get a, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Let me show you something. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Remember we read this, but let's reemphasize. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. And then it goes on to list the gift of faith in verse 9. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The gift of faith listed in verse 9. We know there's the measure of faith. We know there's saving faith. We know there's the spirit of faith. What is the gift of faith? The gift of faith has to be others-centered because all spiritual gifts do something in other believers. The spiritual gifts, except for the gift of speaking in tongues, which has three expressions. We can do a whole different teaching on that. The spiritual gifts have the function of helping others. So the gift of faith is not you having strong faith. The gift of faith is you being able to stir the faith of others. This is why the gift of healing and the gift of faith usually come hand in hand. If you ever come to one of our services, I'll begin to minister to the sick. Usually I'll preach a sermon, take an offering. Then I'll do this other thing where I have everyone stand. We begin to worship. And I just start to talk about Jesus, Christ the healer. I start to read healing verses. And what's happening there is people's faith is being stirred. Why? Because the gift of faith is in operation. And they begin to believe, maybe I can be healed. Maybe this can happen for me. And then they go from maybe it can happen to, no, this is happening to me right now. And before they know it, they're stepping out of their sickness. Why? Mm. Because that's the gift of faith stirring their faith. So God put that in you. That drawing of the sick, they come to you because they see something special on you. And when they get near to you, the gift of faith kicks in and they start to believe for their miracle.
So that's a little side note there, another insight <laughs> that the gift of faith is often tied with the gift of healing. Wow. But sign number four is a clear one. The sick are just for some reason drawn to you. Or people call you all the time, hey, so-and-so is sick, but I'm asking you to pray. They don't, I guarantee you, hear this now, I guarantee you they're not calling everyone. Hmm. I guarantee you they're not texting everyone. I guarantee you they're not Facebook messaging everyone, not all the time. In some instances, maybe if they're in an emergency, they'll text everyone. But have you ever noticed that they just, for some reason, always text you? They always call you? They always send you a Facebook message or an Instagram message? Why? Because the sick are drawn to that healing power, and they don't even know they're being drawn. This was the case with Jesus, too. Number five, you have great faith. With every gift, remember this, with every gift comes the faith to operate in it. God will not give you a gift without the faith that it takes to exercise that gift. You're the type of person who has childlike faith, not childish faith, childlike faith. When everyone else is saying, oh, that's it, when everyone else is mocking the idea that they could be healed, when everyone else is cynical about the situation, when everyone else is panicking, there's something deep down within you, a stillness, a calm, a certainty, a hope, a spark of divine inspiration that says, no, they're going to be healed. Jesus is going to make them well. No, they're not going to die. They're going to live. No, that mm. sickness is not going to be on them forever. They're going to be healed. That, that faith that rises in you whenever sickness comes about or whenever sickness is around you is a sign that God has given you the gift of healing. And remember, the gift is different than just the operation. One is a function. The other is a focus. There is a hyper intense, more potent grace for healing on the one who has the gift of healing. Again, otherwise, why would we need the gift of healing? John chapter 14, verse 12 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Now, in context here, Jesus is talking about people believing on him, becoming his followers, being able to do miraculous signs as he did them. But in principle, we can glean this truth. Faith comes before results. That if God gives you a function, he's going to give you the faith. If God gives you a focus, he's going to give you the faith for that function and that focus. You know that you know that you know. There's just this faith in you for miracles. And again, as I said, when everyone else is panicking, doubting, being cynical, saying, oh, forget it, it's done, you're saying, no, 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 no. Something else, something else is rising. Right at that last minute, that's the gift of healing in operation in you. Wow. I'm going to give you sign number six right now. And sign number six is going to seem obvious, okay? I'm going to say sign number six, and you're going to go, well, that's obvious. That should have been known. But people miss sign number six all the time. Even though it's obvious in principle, it's not so obvious in practice. So we all know it, but we, we don't always see it when it's in action. So I'm going to give you that sign right now. But first, let me encourage you. If you're new to this channel, you're watching this stream, you haven't seen much of our other content, or maybe you have, I encourage you to subscribe to Encounter TV. Encounter TV is biblically balanced and spirit-filled. You're going to get the scripture. It's Christ-centered. It's built on a solid foundation, but it's also spirit-filled. We allow the Holy Spirit to move. And biblically balanced and spirit-filled, by the way, are not at odds with one another. I release teachings and sermons on the Holy Spirit, prayer, spiritual warfare, topics in the supernatural, the call of God, things like this. I also show footage of the power of the Holy Spirit in action, so the gifts in operation. And of course, we also do live streams like this and live streams of our encounter services that we hold all around the world. Bottom line, if you love the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, Encounter TV is for you. So subscribe right now and click that notification bell. When you do, I know you'll be blessed by the content that's coming out of Encounter TV. Number six. Again, I said this was going to be obvious. I said this is obvious in principle, but not in practice. So don't just dismiss it right when I say it, okay? I'm going to say it but I want you to hear me out here. <laughs> it's going to almost sound oversimplistic. Number six, the sick are healed. And you say, okay, well, obviously, if I have to get the healing, the sick are going to be healed. But let me show you something here. But first, let's recap. Number one, you have a desire for the gift of healing and are drawn to the healing ministry. 
Number two, you have a deep compassion for the sick and afflicted. Number three, you have tangible manifestations of power around you. Number four, the sick are drawn to you. Number five, you have great faith. Number six, the sick are healed. Now, this one might seem obvious, but we don't pay attention often to how God moves through us, especially if we have a negative self-view. So you may be watching this right now, and you may not have a very positive view of yourself. And if you don't have a positive view of your, and this is not a self-help, new age theology, I'm just telling you reality as it is. You may not have a positive view of yourself. You may have a very negative perspective on you as a person. And because of that insecurity, because of that negative perspective, it's possible that God is doing good things through you, but you're just not looking at them. You see, sometimes we have the tendency to highlight the bad things happening in and through us and to ignore the good things happening in and through us. But let me just for a second highlight something to you. It may happen more often than you think. You might think, oh, I've seen a couple miracles in your life, but if you really, in my life, but you may stop and think. And you may realize that if you really pause for a moment and you start to think about it, is it possible that miracles are actually more frequent than you've paid attention to? Is it possible that people are healed quite often around you? You just never really thought anything of it? That is possible for some. It may happen more often than you think. Look at what happened here. I'll give you an example of this. Look at what happened to Jesus in Luke chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 11 through 19. Larger portion of scripture here, but it's, 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 it's good to note this. Watch this now. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. In other words, to verify their healing. And as they went, they were cleansed with leprosy. That's a whole different sermon in and of itself. As they went, they were healed. But we'll, we'll, we'll just keep reading verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. Verse 16, beautiful moment here. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to this man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. The reality is people don't always come back to testify. And I know this because I get messages on Instagram all the time from people who say, hey, I was at the service in California. I was at the service in Orlando. I was there when you ministered in Taiwan. And I got healed, but I just didn't say anything. And then they give me this amazing story, like they had a tumor and it was, it was gone when they went home, or they had paralysis on a certain part of their body and the paralysis left, or they were deaf and the ear opened. I'm thinking, man, it would have been great if you testified. A lot of people would have been encouraged, but the reality is that sometimes people just don't testify. They'll come to you for prayer because they're desperate, but you're not always going to hear back from people who are healed. So it's possible that it happens more often than not. One more time, I'm going to recap and then I want to pray for you. I believe that God's power is going to touch you in a fresh way right now. Let's believe God right now. Right now, I, I, I believe this so strongly by faith. Whether you're watching live or on replay, I believe the anointing is flowing now. And I believe some things are going to be stirred in you. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you strongly. Many of you, in the next few minutes, are going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit in a very intense, very strong way. I'm going to recap and then I believe God's power is going to flow. Number one, you have a desire for the gift of healing and are drawn to the healing ministry. Number two, you have a deep compassion for the sick and afflicted. Number three, you have tangible manifestations of power around you. Number four, the sick are drawn to you. Number five, you have great faith. Number six, the sick are healed. Let's pray now. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this tangible touch of your power. And I pray right now, Lord, that that one watching would receive a fresh touch of your Holy Spirit's power. Let them receive a fresh touch of power from on high. Something's happening right now. I can sense it. Let them receive a fresh touch of power from on high.
Let that anointing begin to fill you afresh. Thank you, Jesus. I want, if you pray in the Holy Ghost, begin to pray out loud in the Holy Ghost right now. I believe there are tangible manifestations of God's power right now. Some of you may feel heat on you. Others electricity. Others that weight. Some like that water. Some may not feel anything at all. But the presence of God is moving. Father, stir up that gift. Cause them to stir up that gift. Let them see miracles. Miracles, Lord. Let that healing virtue flow to their physical beings, just as it did to the body of Christ. Let them see the sick raised out of their sickness. Let them see the afflicted go free. We thank you for this power, Lord. We thank you for what's flowing now. I want you by faith, just begin to receive this. Something is happening here. For some of you, this is going to be a transforming day in your life. Don't be afraid to step into what God has given to you. Don't allow the enemy to discourage you from stepping into that gift that God has placed on your life. Stir up that gift. Holy Spirit, give them boldness. Power from on high. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, Amen. I want to show you something here. Go to 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm going to read about eight verses to you. I want you to hear this. I really want you to hear this. 1 Kings chapter 17 verses 8 through 16. I'm going to say something that needs to be said. Okay? This needs to be said. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So God is instructing his prophet to go to a certain city, and there a widow has received instructions to feed that prophet. So he went to Zarephath, as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks and asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread too. So he's insisting here. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. So I'm going to stop here at verse 13. We'll continue in a moment. So here's a widow. During a famine, the prophet comes to see her. Make me some bread. Give me some water, he says. She says, look, I just have enough for me and my son to have one last little meal, and then we're going to die. That's a stark situation indeed. Verse 13, But Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Now, that right there, if anyone were to do that today to a widow and somebody captured that on video, oh my goodness, it would go viral. And the church in their ignorance would criticize that man or woman of God. They would criticize so harshly that man or woman of God, not understanding how the Holy Spirit works in these situations. Go ahead and do just what you said, he said, but make a little bread for me first. He said, okay, I understand you're going to make a meal and then you're going to die, but make some for me first. How, how very forward of him. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Verse 14, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So in other words, God's going to take care of you during this famine. Do what I'm telling you. Take care of the prophet first, and then I'll take care of the rest, says God. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. Wow. Verse 16, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised to Elijah. So here we see a woman in a very difficult circumstance. Now, here's what needs to be said. I told you this needs to be said. I'm going to say it. We have to stop with the fear-mongering in the body of Christ. Mm. 
We have to stop panicking every time the headlines don't go our way. We have to stop freaking out every time some so-called expert gets up and says something negative about the economy, about health, about the world at large, about war, whatever it may be. We have to begin to base our faith on what God has said and not on what man says. So today, there's a lot of fear. Fear is fighting the church today. That's why the prophet said, don't be afraid. He starts with don't be afraid. And then the portion I read to you ends with, there was always enough. So what happens in between don't be afraid and always enough? Don't be afraid and always enough. She gave. You see, in times of famine, people freak out. In times of famine, people lose their faith. In times of famine, the wealthy hoard their wealth not wanting to do anything for fear that something may go wrong. And the people who are not so wealthy, maybe middle class down to the poor, they also freak out, but in their own way. Everyone hoards in their own way. Everyone's fear-filled in their own way. But the prophet, the word says, don't be afraid. And what is the result of acting in faith instead of fear? There was always enough. There will always be enough. Stop listening to the fear mongers. Stop listening to the doomsday prophets who take advantage of headlines for clicks and views. Stop listening to the prophets of Baal that we call the news media. Turn them off. Face this in faith. Our ministry has grown almost six times its size in the past year and a half. Why? Because we operate in faith. We're growing bigger and faster than ever before in the middle of what people are calling a recession, in the middle of what people are calling a pandemic, in the middle of uncertainty, political uncertainty all around the world. Why is that? Because we operate by faith. And so my encouragement to you today is to give to this ministry by not being held back by fear. See, the wealthy hoard when they're fearful. They have what they need, but then they hoard their excess. And everyone else... We just hoard what we little we have and we tighten up this and we, we hold back there, but don't hold back. You see, it's in that giving that provision is created. Now, I don't believe you can buy a miracle. You can't buy your healing. You can't buy prophecy. You can't buy the anointing. But this is a principle of giving that God has established in his word. When there is calamity, when there is famine, when there is chaos, have faith. Don't focus on what's happening around you. Focus on what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says, don't be afraid. We have no reason to fear. God will make sure there's enough. There will be enough flour. There will be enough oil in your jar. It's not going to empty itself. Why? Because we step out in faith. So, I want to challenge you to step out in faith by asking you to give to this ministry. Not to me personally, to the ministry, to the work of God. This is His work. And I also want to update you on Project ETV. Those of you who are familiar with Project ETV know that we're building a production studio in Austin, Texas. Now, last week, let me just do the math real quick here. Last week, I actually talked to you about the fact that we needed 950,000 by May, I think here, May 15th was the deadline. So let me just do this real quick. I'm going to do some math here. The overall goal was for phase one is 2.75 million, 2 million seven hundred fifty thousand. That's nothing for God. Don't even worry about that. It's going to be met. And then I see we have raised 1.855. And let me just get the exact change here. 792. You got to hear this. So last week on Wednesday, I told you we needed another 950,000 to come in by May 15th. As of today, less than a week later, we need less than 900,000. So that means over 50,000 put into this project. 894,208. We are at 68%. So you can show the graphic still, Tim. <laughs> this is incredible. Show the graphic still. We, we, we're at 66. We're actually 68%. It's no longer 950. It's 895, somewhere around there, as I just put it on my calculator. Don't quote me exactly. I just did the math for you. If you want to rewind a little bit, you'll get the exact number. But help us do this. We want to finish this project, and we will. God is a God of miracles, and finances are no exception. 
The need will be met. This ministry's needs are going to be met. Your needs are going to be met. This ministry is going to thrive. You're going to thrive. Let's link together here in the favor of God. And I want you to give to this project. Some of you wealthy people can do the six-figure donations. That's why God blessed you. Not so you could buy the other car or the other boat or the extra property. Sometimes those are good things to get. Sometimes you want those types of investments. But God made you wealthy because he knew he could trust you with his resources. And this is good ground to sow into. Your gift will make impact. So maybe the wealthy God is calling to give the six figures. Maybe there are those who you can't give the six figures, but you can do something else. But we did the math and we found that if the average gift is about $50 to $150, that with just about 10% of our following, we could actually meet this need in a day. But the sad reality is, is that not everyone's going to give. Why? Because some are afraid. Some think that if they give, they'll go without. But that's not true in the kingdom of God. You can count on the word of God. So I'm asking my friends, my supporters, my family, I'll be doing these fundraisers for the next 15 weeks or so until we meet that goal. So we're going to up the fundraising a little bit just to make people aware. Because believe it or not, even though I talk about it this much, there's thousands of people who still don't even know about this project. So if you've heard about it several times, it's just because you're a faithful viewer. I'm talking to everyone on our list. I'm talking to every one of our viewers. Go right now and give a gift. Maybe you can do a gift of 100. Maybe you can do a gift of 1,000. Maybe you can do even more than, there are people who can wa watch right now who can do 10,000. There are people who can do the six-figure donations. And it's all of us together giving to the work of God, putting God's kingdom first. That's what will do it. We trust God for the provision, but God uses people like you. So I want to thank you for your love for souls, your love for the gospel, your love of this ministry. You believe in what we're doing. You want to help us make this impact. This studio is going to, I'm telling you, exponential growth for this ministry. We can win more souls than ever before, do more broadcasts than ever before, release more content than ever before, reach more people than ever before. Exponential growth. This door is before us. A generation is waiting. A generation is calling. Answer that call with us. Go right now, davidhernandezministries.com slash expand and give your gift toward this project. Or you can give a general gift at the regular donation form. But right now we're pushing davidhernandezministries.com slash expand. Go and give to the gospel work. This is good ground. We're going to see this project finish. This is God's project. This is God's vision. He will provide. Don't withhold. Step out in faith and help us accomplish this God-given vision. One more time, I'll tell you. DavidHernandezMinistries.com slash expand. Help be a part. You can be a part of this. Be a part of this. We will meet the goal. We will finish this project. Join in on what God is doing.